cartoons are perfect entertainment for growing children. With zippy music and outrageous action, they hold kids' attention and activate their imaginations. Some shows work to entertain kids and their parents by subtly adding in some very mature themes. Paying close attention to some cartoons can get dark. From a broken fairy family to bossing around babies, here are 10 dark cartoon theories that will ruin your childhood. Before we begin, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and click the notification bell for more amazing videos every day. That being said, let's begin. Huh? Hmm. Hmm. Number 10. Fairly Odd Parents. Double Troubles. Timmy Turner is a neglected boy with a very active imagination. The show centers on the misadventures of Timmy and his flying magical godparents who grant his every wish. Cosmo and Wanda are loving godparents, however, their interference in Timmy's life usually goes wrong. It's not a far stretch to think that Timmy created them from his imagination because he doesn't get enough love, support, and guidance from his cold parents. But why are they so distant? Some superfans think Mr. and Mrs. Turner are wounded by a tragic past. There are subtle hints that Timmy wasn't the only child born to the family. Timmy may have had a twin sister. Here are the clues. In the episode Channel Chasers, we get a future look at Timmy's family and he's got twins. Having fraternal twins is a hereditary trait, meaning his mom could have carried twins. If you listen carefully to the dialogue, you'll notice they call Timmy their only son, not necessarily their only child. Plus, look at how outrageously large his mom is in this flashback. There isn't a lot of material out there to cheer up bereft parents, and maybe creator Butch Hartman has used 16 seasons of the Fairly Odd Parents to help the people he cares about deal with loss. Number 9. The Rugrats Are Imaginary Characters this next theory makes more and more sense the longer you think about it. Rugrats centers on a group of babies that play together in their small neighborhood. We take for granted that all kinds of cartoon characters normally wouldn't talk. Animals, even cars, have personalities in the animated universe. But Rugrats is so low on cartoonish action and high on realism, it does stick out a little that the babies talk. The only kids big enough to talk are Angelica and Susie. Consider this. Angelica, clearly a troubled child, made the babies up in her mind for someone to talk to and terrorize. How is it Phil and Lil are both identical and fraternal twins? Maybe Angelica doesn't understand the biology and just rolled with it. The Pickles, Tommy's family, is dysfunctional. The patriarch Stu compulsively builds toys in his basement, a plausible obsession for a bereft dad. Same with Chucky's family. Chucky's dad Chaz is neurotic, and we know that Chucky's mom died in a car accident. Angelica's only real friend is Susie, who maybe tolerates her out of pity. Number 8. SpongeBob's hometown is the bomb. Bikini Bottom is a tight-knit community at the bottom of the sea. It's home to SpongeBob, Patrick, and all the other crazy characters. One fan theory insists that this world is so crazy as a result of fallout from a nuclear explosion. The U.S. colonized a group of isolated islands in the Pacific Ocean called Bikini Atoll, anglicized to Bikini Atoll. In the 40s and 50s, the U.S. used these beautiful tropical islands to test bombs. 67 nuclear weapons were detonated there. The name of their town is one coincidence. In fact, the scandalous skimpy swimwear, the bikini, was named to piggyback off the controversy of the bomb testing. The other commonality supporting this fan theory is the constant explosions and the specific familiar form they take. Explosions on SpongeBob SquarePants look remarkably like the footage of the Bikini Atoll explosion. Sometimes this silly show makes such bleak points about work and life, it seems possible it could be a dark tribute. So did the radiation make all the characters so wacky? Maybe the pineapple symbolizes a fallout bunker. What do you think? Number 7. Toy Story 3 equals World War 2. Toy Story is a fun, light-hearted story about friends trapped together owned by something massive compared to their size. The premise is already a little macabre. Before we talk about Toy Story 3, look back at the first two movies. They take place during the space race, and the changing times drive the conflict between Woody and the new guy, Buzz Lightyear. In the third installment, Andy's ready to go off to college, so the toys ponder their fate. Woody rallies the group and gives a speech, which drama buffs can confirm is unusually similar to a scene in The Pianist, an award-winning Holocaust movie. 
Not a coincidence. After this, Buzz suggests they go hide up in the attic, a common place for old toys, but also the famed hiding place Anne Frank and her family spent years in while hiding from persecution. The story follows a clear Holocaust allegory. The world turns its back on the toys and they're packed tightly together and carted off to a daycare. The daycare represents the concentration camps, a place where the toys are sent to die. The toys are neglected, abused, and even incinerated once once broken. That's dark enough, but there's a huge visual cue telling us to think deeper about what's going on. There's a world map in all three movies, with the map in the third version showing some unfamiliar borders. Knowing how many people work on animated films, especially Pixar films, the inconsistencies can't be an oversight. History buffs who have pondered the changes to maps between the sequels speculate there was a world war between two and three. The similarities are too close to overlook. There are guards, privileged prisoners, all the horrors, the only major difference is the happy ending. In Toy Story 3, the gang is saved by the aliens, reunited with adult Andy, and adopted by a new home. Bonus theory. The ending isn't quite what it seems, and the toys didn't make it out of the incinerator. Maybe they perish, have one last spiritual encounter with Andy, and enter toy heaven. Number 6. Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Friends forever. Ed, Ed, and Eddie, along with the rest of their gang, explore every square inch of Peach Creek. Just some carefree friends playing for a seemingly endless summer, or lost souls thrown together to not quite suffer for eternity. You only have to watch an episode to know that these kids have less than perfect lives at home. But maybe there's deeper symbolism at play with this show. They might be dead in purgatory. Let's think about the evidence. Why are all of the main characters' tongues dark? Maybe it's not from candy dye, but the pallor of death. The show never leaves the cul-de-sac, and the summer vacation never ends. Not even at the end of the seasons. Somehow, these kids seem to be from different eras. Ed is reclusive and loves monster movies, a total 50s kid. Now for the second Ed, Double D. He's plagued by endless post-it notes with chores to do from his parents. Not quite a torture, but not exactly paradise since he's never thanked by them. He never removes his hat. Could he have suffered a horrible accident or died after unsuccessful chemotherapy treatment for his cancer made him bald? He loves technology, a total 80s kid. Eddie's brother tormented him, we find out at the end of the series. The only time they leave Peach Creek is the only time we meet him. Could this be that they left purgatory to visit hell? Number 5. King of the Hills Paternity Plot this show about a quaint Texan dad and his neighbor buddies is chock full of slow burn jokes and smart references. Watch a few episodes and you can't miss the truth about the neighbor boy Joseph Gribble. It's painfully obvious that John Redcorn, Nancy's longtime lover, is the real father. Obvious to everyone but Dale. At one point, conspiracy happy Dale rationalizes his son is so different because he's an alien. Whether we're laughing at Dale or taking pity on him, we are falling for the writer's misdirection. Direction. Just as Dale is oblivious about Joseph's parentage, audiences were slow to pick up on Bobby's real father. We all know Hank has a narrow urethra, but have you ever noticed that Bobby doesn't resemble Hank very much, physically or with his personality? How about the way Peggy gets annoyed whenever Bill's around? One time, Bill confesses he and Peggy were intimate in a moment of weakness, to which Hank replies, no you didn't, Bill. We laugh at Dale for being oblivious, while the writers are laughing at us. We knew creator Mike Judge was a genius when he created Beavis and Butthead, but sweet lady propane did he ever get us with this one. Number 4. Who Framed Roger Rabbit is historically accurate, kinda. Audiences got more than they planned on watching this live-action cartoon hybrid. A silly romp about clearing the name of a lovable misfit quickly turns into an allegory for institutionalized racism. The parallels between Toontown and America's dark segregationist history are undeniable. When you watch Who Framed Roger Rabbit as a child, it hurts to see humans hate cartoons. Toons, they call them, and you understand that's a slur. Judge Doom executes cartoons at will. 
older kids might understand that's lynching. Watch as an adult and you understand the whole premise is about systemic racism. Judge Doom has nobody stopping him from dissolving guilty tunes in his dip, and his plan to dismantle the tunes trolley to build a highway for rich people is the pure lawful evil you can read about in human news today. Even our human protagonist, Eddie, wants to believe that the residents of Toontown he's friends with, like Roger, are some of the good ones. The fact that Eddie struggles with his unnatural attraction to Jessica Rabbit makes this theory hit you like a pie in the face. Number 3. Hey Arnold is a show about Helga. This one doesn't take much evidence to make you consider it could be true. As kids in the 90s, we took for granted Arnold being the protagonist. His name is in the title. But who is actually saying that? It's always Helga. At first, Helga is the villain of the show, always bullying Arnold and calling him football head. Her unrequited love is the main constant throughout the show. Most shows with bullies rarely, if ever, show their home life and explain why they're bullies. Nelson from The Simpsons has a neglectful family. Roger from Doug has a neglectful family. The Fonz, say it with me, had a neglectful family. It's a repeated trope that her father calls her only the girl, and both favor her big sister, Olga. For just a a bully, that's a lot of backstory. It's unhealthy to teach kids that when someone's mean to them, it's because they like you. This cartoon takes this idea on directly. Eventually, Helga did confess her true, intense, poorly directed feelings for Arnold. Number 2. Zazu is a traitor. If the line, I've never seen a kind of beast with quite so little hair, is hinting at anything, along with a lot of Zazu's lines in not just the I just can't wait to be king number, but the entire film, it's that Zazu really does not like the idea of Simba being king. The most noteworthy line is, if this is where the monarchy is headed, count me out, I won't hang about. It seems pretty clear that Zazu would willingly rebel against Simba if Simba were declared king. Because of this, some fans think Zazu may have worked with Scar, communicating off-screen, and helped him pull off his plan to dispose of Mufasa and drive Simba out. Adding to the theory is that when Nala and Simba enter the elephant graveyard, Zazu comes to find them, but Scar was the only other one who knew where they would be. Number 1. Inspector Gadget is a replacement for a deceased man. Some people think Inspector Gadget is more than just a cool robot policeman. Some people think he's actually the second Inspector. These theorists believe Inspector Gadget was built as a robotic replacement for a human Inspector who lost his life on the job. But here's where things get more interesting. The original Inspector did not lose his life. He went missing. And upon finally returning home, horribly disfigured from the ordeals he experienced, he sees a robot living his life and snaps. He became Dr. Claw. Has this list changed the way you remember your favorite cartoons? Are you going to go back and watch them again now that you're older and wiser? Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time.